It's a joy to be a priest. Uh, I love it. And uh, it's, uh, my assignment full-time is at a high school called Chesterton Academy of the Holy Family, which is in Lyle. And I serve there as the head of school, which is the fancy term for, like, principal, I guess. And uh, so one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing is discipline. Now, I don't know if I strike you right now as, like, a real firm disciplinarian, but um, I have my moments, I suppose. And one of the things I love about that aspect of the job in particular is being able to work with students individually and kind of as a group and watch them start somewhere and end up in a different place, in theory, right? Now, they don't all end up in a different place, but that's what we want. So when they come in as freshmen and they have all of their little freshman things that they do, it makes sense that in the first quarter of the school year, the highest number of demerits is often given to freshmen. Um, some places, by the way, have demerits, and they're called jugs. You ever heard of that? Justice under God. Some high schools do that still. Don't bring God into uniform issues or gum chewing. He doesn't want to be a part of it, and he doesn't need to be a part of it. So anyway, it makes sense. But as the year's gone on, and it's true of this year as well, that uh, the number of demerits for the freshmen has gone down, and they're learning, right? Demerit is not meant to be the end of the world. It's just a way of saying a little correction. You know what I mean? And they're learning. It's beautiful to see, especially the freshmen, the difference now in the spring semester than when they started. They're a little taller. Their voices are a little deeper, a little more, you know, standing up straight. Um, They're coming to school on time. Their skirts are the right length. It's just like it's a nice thing, you know? (laughs) We're growing. We're making progress. And the thing that will never make sense to me is the unique phenomenon that when the freshmen leave for the summer and they come back as sophomores, like, where did the progress go? <laughs> what happened here? And yes, they're, they're more mature in certain ways, but a lot of what they get themselves into is actually more annoying than it was last year, you know? They come in and they're timid and they're shy, and now they're coming to a place and they feel comfortable there, And so in their comfort, maybe they're acting out like a little bit more. We call that being sophomoric, right? Yesterday, I guess two days ago, Friday, I had a great and beautiful experience. Uh, In the spring, we get ready for our big gala every year, which is this year is on March 4th. And two senior students always present a kind of testimony at the gala. And, you know, it's... A beautiful experience. This year we have 38 seniors, so I couldn't listen to 38 speeches, or I would poke out my eyes. And so I decided, why don't we read them all, and then we'll whittle it down, and I'll have the 10 finalists present their speeches, not just for me and some teachers, but for the freshmen and the sophomores, because it's good for the freshmen and the sophomores to see, like, what could a product of this school really be like, you know? So we did that yesterday, or Friday after lunch, and these seniors, you guys, they're sharing these stories, the classic, like, I didn't want to come here, and then I'm glad I did come here, you know, or they're talking, one, one guy gave a, a beautiful testimony about how the beauty of the great books curriculum, the classical curriculum, really spoke to him in a moment of depression and darkness in his life, and he was able to find beauty. My gosh, uh, it's people just speaking about how they've met the Lord at this school, they've been able to really grow and change because of the experience there. And I'm just like, man, you know, like this is beautiful. I'm so proud of these guys. And then you got the sophomores. <laughs> you know, dropping things, snickering, talking to each other, laughing, not paying attention. This year, instead of just saying, you have a demerit, I have gotten demerit pads. So I was like, Shh. and I, it's very dramatic. You can rip them off, you know what I mean? <laughs> They're carbon copy. I get one, you get one. So, of course, to repay me, they've been posting them, pasting them to their inside of their lockers now as like their trophies. You know, it's not really what I wanted. But I mean, I was handing these things out yesterday to hotcakes because it makes me crazy. Do you know what I mean? The freshmen were perfectly behaved, but the sophomores, why are you this way? It's tacky, is what it is. It's tacky, it's tasteless. It's insipid. 
The Latin word for tasteless is insipidus. And the Greek word that that comes from is the same root of the Greek word sophomoros. <laughs> Sophomore, in case you don't know, means wise fool. Sophos is wisdom, philosophy, lover of wisdom. Moros, of course, is moron. Sophomoros, <laughs> you're being a wise moron. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if you lose your flavor, the word that Jesus uses there is insipidus, sophomoric, tasteless. You're behaving without taste. In other words, you are not fulfilling your Christian mission if your flavor goes away. Why? Why? Because what is the Christian mission in this regard? The Christian is to serve in the world as a way of making life tasty. The better word is palatable. Palatable. When I was a three-year-old, the first time I ever remember getting into big trouble was when I told my mother at the dinner table that her breaded pork chops looked like poop. <laughs> but what I would have said had I had the mind I have now is, I cannot imagine a possible world in which this food is palatable. <laughs> and nothing that you say, dearest mother, can make this food palatable. Now, I happen to like breaded pork chops today. That's conversion, right? <laughs> but Isaiah warns us against three things that make life very difficult, that make life in a way unpalatable. Oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech. Listen, making life palatable for the people around you doesn't mean making life less difficult. Life is difficult as the sophomores are learning. Life is difficult. It was difficult in the time of Jesus. It was difficult in the time before Jesus. It's going to be difficult 100 years from now. Life is difficult. It's hard to grow up. It's hard to face the facts. It's hard to live in reality. It's hard. There is disease. There is death. There is division. There is joy and then the feeling of joy going away. Life is difficult. And making life palatable for each other does not mean we make life less difficult. I cannot take away your difficulty. What does it mean to make life palatable, to make life tasty, to make life be filled with joy? What does it mean? This is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Do not ever think that being a Christian means being nice, kind. Atheists are kind. Some of the nicest people that I know do not believe in God. Atheists have soup kitchens. Remember that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in the garage makes you a car. <laughs> There's a way of seeing. Christianity is a worldview. Christianity is a way of seeing the difficulty of the world in a different way, in a way that does not lead us automatically toward despair. To make life palatable means, first of all, to come to know the one in whom we believe. Because sometimes when we ask this question, this is a soapbox and I won't get on it, I promise, but the question, what would Jesus do, makes me crazy. It makes me crazy because what does that sound like to you? If he were here, what would he do? Baby, he is here. He is alive. And if Jesus is not alive, then to hell with all of the stuff. If he is alive, however, if he is powerful, if he is present, if he is interested in you and me, then everything is different, and that changes the difficulty. It doesn't change the circumstances. The world is always going to throw at us what the world is always going to throw at us, right? But it changes the way that we see the difficulty, that finally difficulty in life, the, the hardness of life, the difficulty of relationships, the insipidness of people. It doesn't become a roadblock to my flourishing and happiness but it becomes actually the roadway to my flourishing and happiness. I come to teach you about Christ Jesus and him crucified. Why? Because it's in the crucifixion that life becomes sweet, that he becomes fully who he is. 
And this is the difficulty of things like salt. If salt loses flavor, then what good is it? In other words, if salt, if salt ceases to be what it is, then what good is it? But Christ on the cross, he becomes fully who he is, fully obedient to the Father, fully son of the Father, but also fully sacrificial lamb. And in his resurrection, he's revealed into what he fully truly is, which is God incarnate, right? The one who conquers sin and death and gets rid of sin and death and despair. But you can think about people in your life who seem to be not taken away from their sin and death and despair, but people who seem to be the salespeople for sin and death and despair. And if you can't think of anybody in your life who is the salesperson for sin and death and despair, perhaps it is you. I don't know. <laughs> the network around every Christian, the network of relationships around every Christian has to change. It must necessarily change. When you come to meet him, the network around you must change. And I mean this in two ways. One, if you're hanging out with people who are not on the same page with you in terms of this life, I don't mean we all agree on the same thing, but I mean if you don't hang out with people who want you to be holy, who want to see you in heaven, whose only sincere desire for you is to fall down on their own face and look up and see you right next to them for all of eternity around the throne of God, and they are willing to behave and encourage you in ways that will get you there, then you got to go away from those people because they're not your friends. They're not your friends. They might be fun to be with. They might have cool things to say. But if you are becoming someone who the Lord is not inviting you to become because of their influence, then it's time to say, goodbye. We have to change the relationships around us. Otherwise, we're going to keep struggling with this. So if you have people who are around you all the time, and when you're around them, you feel heavy, they're oppressive, everything is terrible, everything is dark, everything is gloomy. And I'm not saying you just have to say, like, you're too depressing, goodbye. But you have to become a person who's confident to introduce into their life that maybe things could be different for them. That by your own example, in the face of your own difficulty, you become a witness for them. That difficulty is not the end-all, be-all of life, and I don't have to give in to it. Because I can see through it, and I can see the pathway that I'm being led to through it. Does that make sense? Difficulty is not the roadblock. Difficulty is the roadway to sanctity. The cross was not an obstacle to the mission of Christ. The cross was the mission of Christ. Because only through the cross was he able to teach us what life could be like in the resurrection. Do you know people who their whole life is about false accusations? False accusations. Everything is someone else's issue. The great deflectors, right? Nothing in their life is like their own problem. Everything was caused by someone else. And if this person were different, or this boss was there, or this car, or this business, or this politician, this per church figure... It's annoying, first of all, but it's hard to, what do you say? You just listen after a while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe you agree with them on some level, but that's not a friendship, right? You don't know anything about the other person. You're not being led into anything. Malicious speech, gossip, and uh, bringing everyone around you down. And you have to say, like, I don't want to go down to your level because <laughs> you're clearly not very happy. I want to come up to a different level and live and see in a different way. And that's why I wanted those seniors to give those speeches to those sophomores especially, is because the sophomores are not completely lost. You know what I mean? They are wise, they are growing, they are maturing, but they need a little correction every now and then because it's easy to go off in these directions where we lose our flavor, where we become tasteless, we become insipid and truly sophomoric. You know that about yourself, and I know that about myself, and I need people around me who can help me stay on this particular path. One of the best parts about being the head of discipline at a school like that is that I can look in the eyes. Do you ever look in the eyeballs, by the way, of a freshman who's just got caught cheating? It's a very interesting phenomenon because a lot of times they're surprised, as you're surprised, that they cheated, you know what I mean? 
and they feel like the whole world is collapsing around them. Every hope that they had for success is gone. And I always look at those people and I say the line that no one likes to hear, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> but it's true, and I explain to them why I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Because if I had expected them to be a cheater, if I thought that they were a cheater to their core, if I thought that they were a nefarious figure naturally, I wouldn't be disappointed. I would say, this is par for the course. Thanks for being who you are, at least. But I say that very intentionally, and then I explain, I'm disappointed because I know this is not who you are, and that who you are is someone who wants a different way, and a way that you can become great. I want you to become great as I know you want to become great, but you got to change. you got to move away. you got to sit in a different spot. you got to change who's around you. you got to look and see things differently so that you can view whatever was motivating you to do that. Like, I would rather you get a B minus and have a great soul than get an A plus and pay for it by losing your integrity and your trustworthiness. These lessons we learn in high school, they carry us through life. So I'm not just talking about other people, but I'm talking about other people in hopes that that would become a reflection for yourself throughout this week. In what ways do I lower the standards around me? In what ways have I given in to these temptations of deflection or false accusations or even malicious speech or gossip? In what ways do I believe that Jesus is not quite risen? In what areas of my life have I not invited him in? In what areas of my life do I believe that Jesus is simply not interested to go? In what places and in what ways have I said thanks but no thanks to the great mystery of redemption which is offered to me? In a few moments, you will come up these aisles and you will eat God and he will live within you and he will change you from the inside out if you let him. And you will experience in a more profound way what these seniors were trying to teach to these freshmen and sophomores on Friday. That once I was this way and now I am this way and the difference in between was him. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once was an awful person to be with at parties, and now I'm delightful because I have taste, and I'm not tacky, and I'm not sophomoric in my behavior, whatever. But I once was this way, and now I am this way, and the difference is him because he is alive. He's alive. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Very convincing, very convincing. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we are a people on fire with faith. God, that was the most Catholic response I've ever heard in my entire life. Is he alive or not? He is alive. And does that make a difference for you? Can it continue to make a difference for you? Yes. But do you need each other? Yes. 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 So tonight around your dinner table, as you're frying up those breaded pork chops... Don't be afraid to look at your sibling. Don't even be afraid to look at your mother or your father and say, geez, you are tacky. <laughs> Fill my life and make it palatable, please.